who's also on our committee. And Tammy Collins, who's on her way with the home-baked cookies from Luca to Beppo. So she should be here anytime. <laughs> and also, we'd also like to thank very much the, the group led by Allison Combs at the Village at Orchard Ridge who provided your delicious breakfast. So thank you, Allison Combs.
there was no part of my experience or background or training, including as an English major, where some of it didn't come into play, at least at some point during, uh, you know, during or over the years, or you know, in some cases over the course of one week. I treated quite a few older adults with uh, with addictions in the hospital. And really, if, if you're being honest about it, in, in any treatment setting, in, in a clinic, in an office, a retirement home, a nursing home, a hospital, the medical surgical floors of the hospital, the intensive care unit of the hospital, you encounter uh, older adults with these problems. Um, the review articles that I read in preparation for this talk uh, used phrases like the silent epidemic epidemic and how this is going to be more and more of a problem in the years to come. This, this I agree with based on my, uh, you know, I guess almost 25 years um, since I, I finished as chief resident of Georgetown Hospital. I guess basically, and I, I apologize, one of the, the parts of being a generalist is that I, I like to look at things from a common sense point of view. Older adults, and you know, people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, with their problems with substance abuse, they might be roughly sorted into two groups. One group might be a survivor, somebody who's had problems in these areas for most, if not all, of their adult life, and managed to to, to survive into, into older age. And the other group is older adults who more or less develop these problems with the, the body blows and the losses that come with getting older. Um, you know, loss of employment, either voluntarily or involuntarily, uh, death of a partner, death of a spouse, death of a pet, um, you know, serious medical illness. Um, as, as most of you know, there are uh, a large list of illnesses that can either get at you gradually or all at once and kind of pile on. Um, people do turn to substances, uh, the most readily available alcohol, but other substances, especially uh, narcotic pain killers, um, with, with great frequency. Um, whether or not it's ever formally diagnosed is a, is a separate question. Let me, let me ask, just you know, maybe a show of hands from the audience, how many of you are in the role of a you know, professional working with older How many of you, through uh, personal experience, are like a main uh, assistant or main helper, caregiver for an older adult? And um, how many of you have done any experience with either uh, residential substance abuse or hospital-based <coughs> substance abuse treatment? So, and there, there are many different approaches. When, when I was in training at, at Georgetown, and uh, you know, Dr. Flynn taught me a lot about working with, with older adults with, uh, with, with alcoholism, whether or not within their family system it was um, addressed as that or not. Um, and Pretty much what, what everybody has some knowledge about is a 12-step program like Alcoholics Anonymous. I found, and I, I'd be interested if, if any of you found otherwise from my experience, that there is a lot of resistance to being referred to or participating in a 12-step program. And this despite the fact that many people who mention in, in passing to me evaluating them in whatever setting, mentioned to me that they'd been sober, that they previously had a, a 
problem with alcoholism, that they were an alcoholic in recovery, who had been achieved sobriety for a number of years. And I'm always interested to learn from, from people on what's, what's worked for them, what's been successful. As a practical person, the advantages of a 12-step program, the advantages are that they're pretty readily available. You know, they're around the country, around the world. You can probably find an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. You can probably find an Narcotics Anonymous meeting. Um, the price is right. Um, in my the later stages of my training and you know throughout my professional career and practice, um, the insurance coverage for chemical dependency services, substance abuse services, either detox or formal rehabilitation program, the, the coverage by commercial insurance has varied widely, but the general trend is that it's been demedicalized and coverage has been cut down. It's been very tightly rationed. And so to me, as a practical person, when I was treating somebody when I was medical director of the hospital in Leesburg, and I was treating somebody either with so-called dual diagnosis, like a major psychiatric illness, they might have been depressed, they might have been dealing with bipolar disorder, and they had a substance abuse problem. Uh, trying to line up some support for them after they were discharged from the hospital. By the way, I always felt that we had the, the easier job. It's pretty simple in, in the hospital setting to detox somebody. The harder part that I always felt was how are you going to stay sober? How are you going to stay clean from the substance that was really getting you in trouble after you were discharged from the hospital? You know, very challenging no obvious answers, and you know, people are different, and the temptations are different. You know, in the case of alcohol, it's, it's all around us. I mean, unless you plan to go to a wilderness location where, you know, where, where uh, you know, alcohol wasn't so readily available, but even in the wilderness, you can brew some sort of hooch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that was the challenging part. And so in my experience, I would recommend um, you know, that a person try and go to a 12-step meeting if they hadn't before and try and locate a temporary sponsor, um, somebody who's, as part of their recovery, would try and be of assistance, give some advice <coughs> on working the steps to stay clean and sober. Um, and, you know, as many of you know, the reactions to that vary quite a bit, and some of them are quite negative. Some people are very insulted if you suggest uh, a follow-up at a, a 12-step program. Some people um, say that that's not for me. Um, some people say that they don't like uh, a group format because it's hard enough admitting it to yourself, much less to one other person. But to, to stand up in a group and say that you're a recovering addict is a very challenging uh, situation. Um, a lot of people, frankly, uh, objected to the religious element, the, the reference to a higher power, and they said, well, it's just too religious. I'm not that way. I'm not going to go. You know, people are different, and it, it varies widely. Another category of treatment that's offered is medications that have come along to, to treat substance abuse. Um, naltrexone or Revia to uh, an opioid blocker that will help a person stay sober. I have some experience with this when I was especially doing the hospital work. Um, it was very difficult to get a lot of feedback from people. If you discharge them on a medication, uh, it was very difficult to get regular feedback. What you tended to get was negative feedback. In other words, people who were not successful and who came to the emergency room and were readmitted to your service because they, you know, they had relapsed. But as far as accurate firsthand assessment of success, that was much harder to come by. I do remember that um, 
you know, certain medications that were there had their limitations. Um, and abuse. And abuse, uh, a brilliant medication with a strategy of something where if you took the pill every day, and even if you had accidental exposure to alcohol, it would make you sick as a dog. And so, so here, you're going to suggest this to a person. Now, start taking this antibuse, this disulfiram. And even if, you know, uh, a friend makes cocoa van, makes a, a chicken in a wine sauce, and they neglect to tell you that they poured some wine in the, in the beef stew or in the chicken, you know, you're, you're going to feel sick as a dog because you took this medication. Brilliant. Um, you know, but, but people's experience being what it was, that, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, really sort of rough strategy for staying sober was something that people decided to accept. Um, you have to individualize assessment and treatment um, as much as you can. You don't want to be prescribing something like antabuse to people who are just too impulsive to really have as much personal control over the next several hours after taking a medicine like that. I have an older brother who is actually a psychiatrist in New York City. He was five years older than me. And great, great guy. He passed away in 2008 from, from lung cancer, you know, non-smoker. But he had a lot of experience earlier in his career dealing with cocaine abuse, mostly in younger middle-aged adults in New York City, but, but a fair number of retired adults. And he began experimenting, since a lot of the people with uh, that form of substance abuse were also depressed. And he, he actually developed uh, an approach of using an antidepressant to cut down on cravings for, for cocaine. But the reason I mention that is antidepressant medication treatment is frequently used off-label, not just for treatment of depression, but frequently for anxiety, frequently for obsessive compulsive tendencies. And all of these things are emotional conditions that feed into uh, you know, using substances in excess of either what was intended in terms of a prescription medication or uh, excess alcohol or, or other substances. In terms of comorbidities, um, it's important to do a good assessment, whether it's a you know, MD psychiatric assessment or, uh, or uh, another professional assessment to see if a person is suffering from an anxiety disorder, is suffering from a uh, severe depression, um, is suffering from uh, a, a psychotic condition, which is putting a person so on edge that you know, substance abuse is a strategy, not a good strategy, but a strategy that is used to block out the, the bad stimuli. And so, um, to me, it's not either or. Either you have a substance abuse problem or you might have a psychiatric illness. It's important to, to consider that, you know, life being what it is, that there, there can be several conditions acting at once. And, and each, each condition has a way of affecting the other condition. And when things are going bad, they can go bad. You know, if, if, you're, if you're abusing substances, you're probably going to be more at risk for depression. And the, the medical condition that you're also dealing with, whether it's diabetes or multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's, you know, they, they may be sobbing their eyes out in front of you and you ask, well, you seem depressed. Oh, no, no, I'm not depressed. Um, it's important to try and get a good assessment because what, what came to mind as we were talking about, you know, the, kind of quality of life and, and you know, treatment. A lot of memory problems, a lot of cognitive problems are multifactorial. There could be Alzheimer's plaques and tangles, and there could be uh, you know,
kind of you know the neurological progression where no matter what you do, cognition and functioning and independence is all going to be on a downward slope in the months and years to come. But when in doubt, if a person seems depressed and they're having memory problems, and you're really aiming for improving their quality of life, probably the most economical, in, in many ways, you know, treatment, medication treatment that you can do is at least consider a trial of antidepressant medication. Um, and, and basically the, the approach is if a person is low energy, having difficulty starting their day, you try and take an antidepressant with side effects that are more energizing, like, like, like Wellbutrin, and have them take it in the morning. On the other hand, if a person is nervous and sort of pacing around, difficult to settle down for the night, you might pick a, a, a medicine that's more calming, more sedating to help them fall asleep, maybe something like Remeron. Um, and and there's, there's everything in, in between. You look at the mechanism of action, you look at the side effect profile. There, there have been very few really uh, double-blind tested um, medications new in dementia research. Um, there are some that are in clinical trials, but since Nemenda was released in 2003, there's been no real breakthrough. Um, the medications for, for dementia, it's kind of like a Chinese menu. In column A on the Chinese menu, there's Aricept, Exelon, and Razanine. And they all pretty much work similarly. And so you pick one from column A, start it as early in the process as you can to try and slow down the memory loss, the cognitive loss, the difficulties with activities of daily living. In column B, there's dementia. That's the only one in that group. They work differently in column A and column D. And so, you know, the most aggressive state-of-the-art uh, FDA-approved treatment is something like Aricept or Exelon and Amanda, and we're, we're waiting for something new to come out that um, will, you know, be a breakthrough that can stop decline of dementia in its tracks. What about magistral acetate? Uh, someone had recommended that to my family, to my family member, yeah. and that really, I mean, and I Maybe mentioned it to other, yes, I mentioned it to yeah. other people, like for my husband's mom just recently, yeah. and it's like, oh, no, don't do that. But then other people are, no, that's really helpful for them. It's, it's so. interesting. Um, I've seen it prescribed a lot. The sad truth is that medications that in middle-aged adults cause weight gain, in older adults where you're trying to get enough calories into the diet to maintain weight, you tend to be less successful. I tend to use more small doses of Remeron and antidepressant to, to stimulate appetite. But where, where Megase is successful, by all means, I mean, I haven't recalled any bad effects from, from starting Megase. to the medication for dementia. Are the medications related to the, how they work to the type of dementia, how the dementia is caused or what it's caused by? Because I know there are different causes for the dementia. Yeah, that, that's a good question. And again, as a practical person, I haven't let it stop me that a person has post-stroke dementia, that there's none of the, like, 10 years of gradual memory loss that's characteristic of typical Alzheimer's type dementia. Instead, they were perking along and functioning well, they had a stroke, and there was a noticeable drop down, a stepwise decline from vascular events. And so the question comes up, well, shall I use Alzheimer's medications in the person with like vascular dementia? And basically, what I mean as a practical person, since there are so few medications that have been shown in large, well-run, double-blind trials to show any benefit in slowing it down, sure, I use it regardless of the type of dementia. Okay, one more question that I think our time's up. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good question. And dementia is the general.
general description. The general description. Dementia is anything that's affecting the brain. Anything neurological that's damaging and killing brain cells that produces a downward slide in memory, cognition, ability to do things for yourself that you've always done, ability to do multi-staff tasks, uh, tasks like like you know, you know making a, a you know ham and cheese sandwich, you know break it down into the steps, and if you're getting it wrong, and you know if you're you know you know if you're using frozen bread and this isn't right, you know. So anything, anything that's injuring and destroying brain cells and leads to decline in memory and functioning is dementia. And Alzheimer's is one type, the most common and the best known type, in which the, what's, what's damaging the brain cells, they think, are amyloid plaques in the brain, this protein that's being deposited in the brain cells, and these neurofibrillary tangles. So plaques and tangles in the brain that typically produce a gradual decline over many years. Like things were noticeable 10 years ago, but things really came to a head like six months ago, but it's been a gradual decline. That's typical of Alzheimer's. And unless you got a, a brain biopsy or you know, a person, uh, you know, one of their brains studied after death and, and look at under the microscope, you can verify that there are these plaques and tangles. A lot of the diagnosis of dementia and of Alzheimer's type dementia is by assumption, by clinical experience, and by family, by family input. Because the person themselves may deny that these changes are happening. But if the, you know, the daughter-in-law who drove the person to be pregnant said that, you know, you know, mom has just asked this question five times in the last hour, and forget that we've already talked about it. That's that's more diagnostic. Thank you.